I'm actually going to give you a little bit of a different flavor of a talk. Um, for those of you who um, are, are Virginia Tech football fans, um, the university um, puts together these things called Hokey Talks before football games, where we get to talk about our research to a, a wide swath of people. Um, and, and so um, I was asked today to kind of give you the talk that I've previously given that. Um, and so that really uh, focuses on kind of the motivation behind uh, the major projects in my research group. Um, and uh, that uh, centers around this idea um, of our energy future. Um, and so I have a lot of different energy sources um, up here. Um, and so um, I have a lot of different energy sources uh, up here, but what I'm going to talk to you about today is uh, my favorite, which is the sun. Okay. Um, so in one and a half hours, enough solar energy hits the Earth's surface to power all of human civilization for an entire year. Okay. That's a huge amount of energy. So you know we could envision some future where um, you know we keep our our solar panels in our basement, and then like on a really sunny day that we know is going to happen, like we wheel them out for like an hour and a half, and they like collect the energy, right? And then we put them back down next to the Christmas decoration. You know, to worry about it for the, end of the rest of the year, right? So um, so that sounds really good. <laughs> However, there are two very large issues with that picture that I just gave you, right? Okay, so one is cost, um, and the second is storage, right? So when we think about the cost of solar energy, we actually, it doesn't look that bad. Um, so when I started this research, it looked pretty dismal in terms of the cost of solar energy. But if you actually look at the cost of building a new plant today, so say you had some land out somewhere, um, and you wanted to build a new power plant, the cost of a solar power plant connected to battery storage is now equivalent to a methane combustion plant. Okay. Um, and this is happening now. So they just bid on a plant, First Solar, which is a, uh, a US company, just bid on a plot of land in Arizona. They were up against all different forms of energy, including um, methane gas. Um, and they won uh, because they were lower in uh, cost now. So we've actually come down quite a dramatic amount um, in cost, um, and that's mainly because of China investments in the silicon um, technology. However, <clears throat> there are not new plants being built every day, and our grid is not na national. And so for us, when we think about uh, putting in a solar panel, say, on our house, it's a really big money issue, right? Um, so we think about that, so so where are the bill payers in the audience? In the audience, yeah? Okay, I don't know. Did you, did you catch that? So she's the bill payer, so go after her later. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so, uh, foundation people are in the room, they were watching. Um, what's, your, what's your electric bill per month about? 107. Okay, so $107. Would you be okay with, with about a thousand seventy dollars? Did the heating? <laughs> right. So most of us are not going to sign up for that large increase in monthly electric bill. But if we were to think about putting solar panels onto our own houses, um, to a large extent, that's kind of where we're at. We're about an order of magnitude higher, so about twenty cents per kilowatt hour versus two cents per kilowatt hour for uh, methane gas. Um, and so um, cost is still um, a major issue. And then, of course, even with silicon solar technology, if you can make it better, um, all of that becomes uh, more competitive. Um, so how are we uh, dealing with cost in my lab? Don't. I know. You're like, I should have to make a solar cell out of donuts. And actually, no, I am. I'm going to make a, a solar cells out of a component uh, that is in donuts. And it's a component that you've uh, interacted with today to replace this idea of silicon, right? So why are silicon solar cells right now um, so expensive? Um, well, I mean, it is the idea that we need to create a pretty low defect silicon to make these solar cells. And so if we could decrease the cost of material we're putting in, um, we could make that money problem a little bit uh, easier to swallow. No pun intended. <laughs> Um, anyway, so uh, so we're going to replace it with um, a chemical known as titanium dioxide. Now, uh, this is a chemical that we've all interacted with today, or at least I, I really hope so, um, because
because it's in toothpaste. <laughs> no, um, so it's in toothpaste. Um, like I said, it's in powdered donuts. So if you have one of the powdered donuts out there from Cara Leaves, that's the TIO2 rumbling around in your belly. Um, it's in uh, white paint. Um, actually, so I did an internship at, well, at the time it was Roman Haas. Then it became Dow, and now it's Dow DuPont, right? But um, when I was working for Roman Haas, I was making paint, and actually the most expensive thing in the paint can was the titanium dioxide. It's actually, uh, but ridiculously cheap because we put it in um, toothpaste. Um, it's also in white bread. So titanium dioxide, if we can put it into these materials that we literally spit down the sink, we would think maybe that would be good to make a solar cell out of. Now, I, I know that now I'm talking to you know a room of people that have some chemical background, and so we know that titanium dioxide on its own does not absorb any visible light, right? It's white. That's what white things do, right? Black things absorb visible light. So when you stand outside in the summer and you're wearing a black shirt, you get hot. But if you're wearing a white shirt, you don't, right? And so you're, now you're all thinking that I'm just nuts. You're like, you're going to make a solar cell something that doesn't actually increase when they interact with the sun. That's pretty stupid. <laughs> um, but what we um, actually do in our lab is work on sensitizing this titanium dioxide to the sun. So um, putting different molecules or materials on the surface of this titanium dioxide to actually have it interact with the sun um, efficiently. Um, and so hopefully, you know, one day, there's this idea of uh, using donut solar cells um, for uh, applications um, that could potentially release, uh, replace our silicon solar cells. All right, so that's what we're doing in terms of cost, right? Trying to decrease the cost of the materials that we're putting into um, these solar cells. But then we have this other huge issue, which is storage, right? Um, the sun is intermittent, right? So that means while we um, are partying over there tonight, right, together and having a good banquet, and my students are in Davidson working really hard, right? <laughs> there is no sun out to power um, you know, all of our lab equipment. So there's no power to power the ovens that are running our experiments, uh, our syntheses. There's no um, power for us to, to run uh, the lights over in the banquet hall. Um, and so we need some sort of storage uh, solution um, to actually make solar energy viable. Um, and so in, in my mind for this, we don't have to look any further uh, than the Hobbs Horticultural Garden for the answer. Okay. No, it seems kind of um, silly, but really, plants do this every day. Okay. Plants take in solar energy and they store it. Okay. So can we utilize what plants have had a very long time to evolve <clears throat> to tell us how to drive this chemistry? So how do plants do it? Well, it's the process of photosynthesis, right? So plants take in sunlight, carbon dioxide, and water, and create sugars. Our store fuel, you know, it's what was also in those donuts. Um, so maybe I should title this mm, talk, these donuts hold our future, our energy uh, prospects. But great, so um, sugar, our store fuel, it's how we run, and they make oxygen, right? And um, we want to do something very similar in my lab. We want to take sunlight, and we want to take carbon dioxide, <clears throat> and water. I don't want to make glucose because nobody's going to take glucose and start shoving it into their gas tank. Right? We're not going to be like, go to the grocery store and get like a pound of sugar and then like dump it in your car and start driving down the road. Like, that doesn't really work. Um, but what we currently use are uh, liquid based fuels. Um, and so, could we use this process to create fuel? So, could I make, could, could I take CO2, sunlight, and water and make methane? Or could I make ethanol, um, butanol, these types of things that we could then envision uh, putting into an engine to actually uh, power uh, vehicles. And so um, you would say that sounds really good, so why hasn't it worked yet? You know, plants figured this out a long time ago, it sounds really good, great, they're the answer. There's a couple big issues um, with this. So the system by which plants do it, um, I'm not saying that all plants die. My plants die because I'm not very good at taking care of them. But um, a couple issues with plants, um, they're only 1% to 3% efficient at that process I showed you. Okay. And I can tell you right now, no one is going to invest in a 1% to 3% efficient energy process. Okay. Second, 
um, the major component of that system, which is responsible for taking the electrons out of water, which is the first step, falls apart once every 30 seconds. In a plant, that's fine, because a plant is this giant system that has little worker bees that can come back and put the system back together every 30 seconds. But I can't <coughs> give you a beaker and say, okay, here's your energy generating system. It's gonna break in 30 seconds. You know, like I, you know, I can't do that. That doesn't work. And so what we need to do as chemists is actually to develop materials that are better than nature. Um, and so um, what we've been working on, finally, here's a slide of MOPS. So can, yeah, so that you can um, see it. Um, what we've been working on um, in our lab are uh, these materials, which were developed in the late 90s, um, although if you go back even further, um, uh, now I'm going to use the word that the vast majority of people in this room love, polymers, right? So coordination polymers, which were developed in the 50s, were the precursor to metal organic frameworks. So coordination polymers are just polymers that happen to have metals in them, right? So they are uh, three-dimensional repeating uh, structures. Um, that have metal nodes connected by multi-dentate organic linkers. Now, um, the big advance between coordination polymers, which were developed in the 50s, to metal organic frameworks, which came in the late 90s, was that you could make them permanently porous. So any time that I took a coordination polymer and I synthesized it, there was solvent stuck inside the coordination polymer. And any time I tried to take that solvent out, the whole coordination polymer collapsed, right? So that wasn't very useful because we didn't maintain high surface area. <coughs> Metal organic frameworks and a, a researcher by the name of Omar Yagi, who had, was at Michigan at the time, figured out a way to make them permanently for us. And so this is now what leads us to those extremely high surface areas that John Morris told us about. So high surface area metal organic framework that's known is 7,000 meters squared per gram. Right. Um, I know maybe that number doesn't mean much to us, but that's huge. Right, so right now, um, what we use as a high surface area support in many of our industrial processes is activated carbon. The surface area of that is 100 to 200 meters squared per gram. So we're talking an order of magnitude higher. Um, and what that means <coughs> is that then we can have an order of magnitude higher reactivity per geometric area in comparison to, with, to current industrial materials. Um, and so that's why we've been using these for a variety of catalytic processes, including chemical worker agent degradation, uh, that um, both Diego and John touched on um, this morning. However, we also um, can use these to kind of fix this energy um, issue. And so um, I'm not the only one working um, on energy uh, at Virginia Tech or in the College of Science. It's actually a strategic, uh, in the Department of Chemistry, where it's a strategic area uh, for us in the department. Um, and so um, I'm working on this. We have uh, Dr. Lou Madsen, who's working on um, new electrolytes for batteries. We have um, Feng Lin, who is working on new uh, battery electrodes. And kind of <coughs> as a team are hoping that we can actually address this so we could make solar energy a viable solution um, in, the, in the future. Um, for instance, <coughs> beyond um, new uh, plant installations. So I hope I've given you a little bit of a vision into one uh, research uh, group. And of course, um, we always have to show our students, right? So um, that's my group um, right now. Um, they're fabulous, they're very young. I just had four graduate students uh, leave me, so it's very sad, but um, I got an influx of, of new, uh, great, enthusiastic um, uh, students. Um, and what I told you about today is, is funded by uh, the Department of Energy. Um, and I'd be happy to take any questions you may have.